Dear friends, thank you very much for joining us for today's academic session. It's part of the Department of Medicine and CMC Wellows academic talks, which we call Department of Medicine academic lunch talks, though it's not lunchtime. And it is my great pleasure to introduce Dr. A.T. Prabhakar. Prabhakar is a student of CMC, for undergraduate and postgraduate, and it is DM Neurology as well in CMC. Now he's a professor of neurology. He's one of our go-to doctors for any clinical problems. He's always available. He comes, he examines, he teaches the undergraduates and postgraduates, as well as faculty, the approach to the patient. And he's always kind and willing to explain at a simple level, though his knowledge is vast. So it's a great honor today to have Prabhakar to teach us. Prabhakar also has been instrumental in arranging a series of lectures, which we're going to have over the nine to 12 weeks. Every week we'll have different classes on different aspects of neurology. The talks are aimed at a postgraduate level, but these talks will also be useful for undergraduates in clinical years, as well as medicine faculty, neurology faculty, students in uh, family medicine, uh, students who are working in a mission hospital or secondary hospitals. So this is a talk which will be widely useful. The talk is on localization in neurology, the philosophy of localization, and how exactly one goes about localizing in neurology. It's, it's, it's a wonderful talk, and I'm sure that you will be greatly blessed by this. Those of you who missed this talk, I know you'll be one, you, you probably are watching it on YouTube now, but we record these talks and put it on our Department of Medicine YouTube channel. And I think it'll also be available on the Neurology Department YouTube channel as well. So that's another site where this will be available. And we please share it widely with as many people as possible. We hope to have these talks every week over the next nine to 12 weeks. So please keep a uh, lookout for these notices uh, from the usual sites and our Department of Medicine website as well for these talks which are upcoming. So with these few words, I would like to also especially thank Hamsa and the team for Asna and the team from telemedicine and Jennifer from medicine department who has arranged these talks very graciously. So I'm really, really deeply grateful to Jennifer and Hasna and her team. So thank you all very much. And I hope you enjoy this one hour session with Prabhakar. Thank you. Today we'll be talking about the principles of localization and uh, diagnostic reasoning in clinical neurology. We'll start off uh, with a little bit of uh, philosophical background. Uh, so in this cartoon is depicted uh, Plato's uh, allegory of the cave. Uh, so I want you guys all to imagine that, uh, imagine that you were born and brought up uh, inside a cave and you're chained uh, to one of the walls and you can't uh, come out of the cave. And the only thing that you can see are uh, shadows that are coming from the light that you see from outside. And all that you can see are just mere shadows. Uh, you really don't know what the real causes of the shadows are. So you don't know whether there's a bird or whether it's uh, somebody holding up a bird and you don't know the source of light. So all our knowledge, uh, according to this allegory is uh, indirect information. So, and so what we need to understand is that all our perception is uh, from through our sense organs, uh, which we know are uh, just uh, not very good at picking up the entire world from outside. And what we perceive as uh, real are mere shadows of real objects that are out there in the world. So let's assume uh, certain things uh, in this the rest of the talk. So, so certain assumptions that we'll be making is that all perception is indirect so in the sense that we don't have any direct access to reality. And all observations that are made, uh, because this talk is primarily a scientific talk, so all observations that we have made, including the one scientific observations, depend on the context because uh, all we know is shadows interacting with each other and how we understand are based on patterns of shadows interacting with each other. So context seems to play an important role. And because we're seeing only indirectly, all information is that we gather is incomplete. And because information that we gather is incomplete, all knowledge that we hold uh, is actually fallible. So in the sense that it can go wrong and we can never be sure that we are hundred percent right. And this makes our understanding merely pragmatic in the sense that uh, whatever understanding doesn't mean that it is actually real, but it is useful for us in everyday life in solving problems in everyday life. So that is how clinical medicine works. Uh, 
So all our clinical perception or understanding is through indirect symptoms and signs, and all our observations depend on the context. All clinical information that we gather is incomplete, and all clinical knowledge, including history, examination, the fanciest diagnostic tests are fallible, and all the use of clinical knowledge is merely for the benefiting the patient and coming to a diagnosis and not necessarily existent in the real world. So this is a philosophical background. Now let's look at uh, the world in general. So if you look around you and science in particular, there's a whole kind of hierarchy of things that you can see. Uh, starting from the universe above, there is the ecosystem, there's the organism. And amongst the ecosystem, there you find yourself who has a body and who's made up of organ system. And as you go down, because we're talking about the nervous system, we're made up of neurons, uh, synapses, neurotransmitters, all the way down to the DNA. And if you don't stop here, you can keep going down uh, to, to atoms, uh, electrons, protons, quarks, nuance, and finally, uh, the empty spaces uh, between them. Uh, so you see that there seems to be a lot that uh, we do perceive in the world. Uh, and there seems to be some kind of order in the world. So there is some amount of predictability in the world. That's why science actually comes in helping us understanding this predictability in the world. Uh, we need to know that whatever we see is not the full picture and there's lots more. So like, for example, uh, there be lots we know about the ecosystem, lots we know about the body, but uh, there is so much uh, that we don't know between these two areas. Like say, for example, we may know a lot about certain organ systems, uh, but when we talk about, say, at the neurotransmitter level or at protein levels, our knowledge must be lacking. So we have a lot within the level, but between levels, our understanding is limited. So now let's briefly look at the scientific method and then we'll try to see how we can apply it to everyday life. So what we do in scientific method is we observe reality. So we observe certain things. That means that we gather information uh, without any biases first. And then we kind of uh, understand, try to understand what's happening and then we generate a hypothesis. So once we do generate a hypothesis, we want to test it. So we do an experiment or, for example, in clinical medicine, you may predict whether a reflex will be exaggerated or depressed, and then you go and test it out. And then you go back and then that becomes the next observation. And then all you, that generates the next hypothesis. So this is a kind of ever recurring circle that goes on. And this is true about clinical medicine as well. So I'd like to talk about uh, certain ways of uh, scientific methods. Uh, traditionally, uh, science follows what is called as reductionism. So in reductionism, uh, you take a complex uh, system and you break it down into the constituent parts and understand them. Like say, for example, you take the body and you break it down in the organs. Organs are uh, made up of cells. And then you go deeper into the cells and you find that there are proteins, RNAs, organelles. So that is how reductionism works. But you'll find that uh, there is a lot of missing information in our understanding. So very often you will find that uh, this ga missing gap of information uh, leads to a lot of errors, especially in diagnosis, because we don't know what's happening at one particular level. On the other hand, there's uh, the newer uh, methods in science is called the systems approach. Um, in the context of uh, clinical medicine, I would rephrase it as contextualism. So for example, you would understand what is the context in which this particular thing happens. You don't need to know all the information and all the finer details, but uh, how objects are related to each other. So like say, for example, how different components, uh, like for example, in a, between level, in a, within a level, so you can understand how certain neurons are connected to different neurons. You don't need to know what the neurotransmitters are or what uh, the genes are involved. Another important way to bridge this gap between reductionism and contextualism is that uh, another method called as a hierarchical reductionism. Say, for example, you uh, you fall down, so you have uh, you go for a exercise and you have uh, uh, severe body pain. You are not going to say that uh, there's a problem in the DNA. So you can explain it by saying that you worked out too much and you have body pain. Say, for example, you eat outside in a restaurant and you develop a gastroenteritis. And you can just say you have a gastrointestinal system dis disturbance. You don't need to go on to the subcellular level. Maybe you have somebody who's developed a behavioral symptoms of schizophrenia. Then you maybe you may invoke the neural networks. And somebody with Parkinson's disease, you may go down to the level of neurotransmitters. So depending on the need, you go into one level deeper of understanding. 
and maybe you deal with uh, somebody with uh, progressive ataxic syndrome and you may go down all the way till the dna and so on and so forth so that is how we understand uh, science and in the context of clinical medicine so uh, it may sound a little complex but we'll get to the simple part here so at the end of this uh, i would like you to conclude that there seems to be some kind of order in the world so it's useful to follow the scientific method uh, and the most important thing is we don't have the full picture and uh, there are a lot of unknown facts as we described and yet a lot of things are predictable so how to get around the unknown is that is where statistics come to play and probability theory comes to play so there's not much of maths in it but uh, in clinical medicine this uh, one particular theorem that everybody needs to know and this is nothing but the base theorem so the base theorem is nothing but uh, in order to make a diagnosis you need to know certain probabilities say for example in this uh, let me just explain this uh, formula so so the what is given as p is the probability so probability and a and b are certain conditions so the probability of uh, a occurring given there is a condition b depends on few other possibilities so what is the possibility is the probability of uh, b happening given a and also it depends on the probability of a happening independently and b happening independently so in order to avoid this being so complicated let's apply it in the clinical context then it makes more sense so let's exam uh, let's say there's a patient who comes to you with a foot drop so let's say and we'll substitute b as an isolated foot drop and a is a stroke so so we want to know what is the probability of stroke given a foot drop so a patient comes with foot drop uh, and somebody calls you and asks you is do you think this patient has a stroke so what does this depend on this depends on the probability of a foot drop being due to isolated foot drop being due to a stroke and most people who've been in medicine you'd realize that that's pretty rare you don't get strokes usually don't present with only a foot drop so you would think that that's pretty low and what is the probability of stroke in a diabetic hypertensive uh, uh, person well probability of stroke may be high and also it depends on a probability of an isolated foot drop and you would find that isolated foot drop is quite a rare condition so you so overall the probability of having in you know, a patient who comes to you with an isolated foot drop you would think that stroke is quite uncommon and you would not make that as your first diagnosis so that is how you would not Uh, not mathematically but conceptually apply based theorem in everyday life let's look at another example uh, suppose instead of uh, a foot drop there's an isolated or a, let's say an upper motor neuron facial palsy so upper motor neuron facial palsy will you make a diagnosis of stroke for that you need to see how common is upper motor neuron palsy facial nerve palsy in stroke and you would think that it's quite common a lot of strokes a lot of the strokes that you see in everyday life tend to have upper motor neuron so the probability is quite high again probability of stroke in a similar population would be diabetic hypertensive vascular risk factors is quite high and probability of an upper motor neuron facial palsy would be quite high compared to a foot drop so this you would think that between an isolated foot drop and a upper motor neuron facial palsy you would likely to consider a stroke in a patient with upper motor neuron facial palsy and this is how you would apply based theorem in everyday life So now going on to the clinical diagnostic reasoning process itself there are kind of two ways about thinking about clinical problems so going through the analogy of the scientific method so you so we start by observation so we start with uh, in clinical medicine we start with the patient's story or his story uh, or her story so you would find that you need to gather information so the initial part of gathering information has to be filter free and not filled with your own theories and hypotheses you should gather data and that is when after that you need to accurately represent these problems and this is where your knowledge and understanding of medicine comes in and that's where context comes in so and in the uh, and there are two methods of an understanding problems so one is the analytical method that's what you're taught in medical school so you need to you need to have a lot of background knowledge that's why we have an entire medical curriculum where your background knowledge is built up over the years and each problem has got certain defining features and certain discriminating features and this is how you come localized to one particular problem and on the other hand as you go through your medical career as a clinician you would realize that you are gathering experience and not just knowledge but a lot of non verbal things lot of things that are not there in books will also keep adding to information and that would be something called as an illness script so illness script is everything about the patient that is not just knowledge so it could be the way they look certain aspects how common diseases behave 
the context in which it happens and it also your own personal experience so all of these will generate biases and these biases will help you accurately represent the problem or it's called the framing of information so, so and what helps you making a diagnosis rapidly in this intuition based pattern is your bias but unfortunately the bias that helps you make the diagnosis also can lead to some errors and later in this process we'll try to find out how to avoid certain biases and one way to avoid bias is to kind of switch between these two processes one is the intuition pattern recognition based process which is quite rapid not very cognitively taxing so as you gain experience you can look at patients come to a rapid diagnosis but the problem is your biases may take you in the wrong direction so you need to keep going back to the analytical method making sure that you're not moving away from the right thought process and sometimes uh, the analytical process on the other hand is quite cumbersome so it may not be practical to apply it in all patients so it's very important that when you whenever you come across a patient who is slightly atypical you have to systematically go through the analytical analytical process and use certain measures like metacognition uh, to overcome your diagnostic biases because in this setting all your biases that helped you make a regular pattern will not help so now going on to the simpler part so we'll leave out the simpler so so we need to go uh, know that uh, patient comes to you there are with symptoms and signs uh, in neurology we first try to figure out what are the anatomical sites that are involved then we say what is the physiological process that is affected then we say what the pathology is and what the etiology is so you need to remember this hierarchy so i i talked about the entire organization of the uh, the universe and each uh, is a level in itself and jumping between levels is a big problem because there's a big knowledge gap and uh, similarly so when you start with symptoms and signs to the anatomy uh, to the anatomical sites affected there's a big jump and between anatomical sites and pathology there's a big jump and between pathology and etiology there's a conceptual jump so as far as possible don't cross these barriers unless you're doing a formal way of thinking about these so when patients come with a symptom don't jump to an etiology always go through the systematical approach of going to the anatomy then the pathology then the etiology so, but, so if you jump from symptoms and signs directly to an etiology you would end up having what is called as a category error and you will be prone to much more diagnostic errors then if you follow this systematic way of thinking so this is a safe and tested way of navigating this kind of hierarchical reductionism and you will have the least probability of errors and the maximum probability of errors when you directly jump from symptoms to etiological diagnosis <coughs> so simplifying it a little further so patient comes to you they come with symptoms and signs then you first localize it to a syndrome and each syndrome has got an anatomical localization and each anatomical localization there are certain pathologies and etiologies you need to think about so if all the previous slides were quite complicated and now this is the time that you start paying attention so now things are going to become more simple so when somebody comes to you with a neurological symptom or sign then we try to see whether these can be localized or non localizable by and large most things can be localized localizable to a single uh, site in the neural axis or multiple sites and the non localizable sites are listed in this slide before and we would never jump to them directly so it's always better to try to localize to one of these sites and then go on to these non localizable sites so this is an important cartoon that uh, i would like all of you to pay attention to so this is a functional mapping or a conceptual map between symptoms and signs and the various sites of neuraxis so in the left hand side you can see that uh, various uh, symptoms uh, syndromes or uh, clinical presentations and on the right hand side is the neuraxis so what uh, is given uh, here is uh, in dotted lines is an isolated involvement of one particular symptoms or sign on a continuous line is uh, a combination of symptoms or signs so a simple i'll run you through this and uh, so and this uh, if you follow this you would find that uh, you would make a reasonably good diagnosis in most clinical contexts if somebody comes to you with isolated problems with awareness or cognition or cognitive decline you are very likely that you are dealing with a problem with the cerebral cortex and not any other site and if somebody comes to you with a loss of consciousness it could be the two of these sites thalamus or brain stem and additionally a systemic cause that contributes to that suppose a patient comes to you with cranial neuropathy which comes uh, again if you want to understand it in terms of symptoms comes to you with double vision drooping of eyelids 
swallowing difficulty hiccups so then you would consider uh, when it's coupled with imbalance while walking or with weakness on one side you would consider brain stem as a possible site on the other hand somebody comes with isolated imbalance then you would think that cerebellum or its connections are involved now let's come to weakness weakness if it is coupled with cranial neuropathy you would think of brain stem weakness coupled with uh, only on one side you would think of uh, lesion above the brain stem weakness only weakness you would think of an element condition it could either be root neuromuscular junction or uh, muscle and isolated sensory involvement you would think of nerve or root involvement so and if you have sensory motor and bladder involvement this collection of symptoms you would most likely deal with or spinal cord so this is actually a probabilistic model and by and large you will be quite accurate uh, you also need to know that from based on fallibilism these boundaries that we've drawn here are not real there will be overlap these are just rules of thumbs and there will be exception to every rule and that doesn't mean that you don't follow any rule so this is a useful model every time that you come across a patient try to use this simple rule and you will be quite accurate so oh. so now let's take certain specific examples let's take an approach to weakness uh, so we would approach weakness as either an acute weakness or a chronic weakness because acute weakness tone will not help us make a localization the only thing that will help you is a pattern of weakness and on the other hand if it's a chronic weakness then tone will also help because a flaccid tone may tell you that it's low motor neuron and a spastic tone will tell you it's upper motor neuron and of course a pattern will continue to help you in even in a chronic condition so what is shown in uh, blue is a lmn kind of weakness and what is shown in uh, pink is actually a uh, upper motor neuron kind of weakness so let's look at each pattern and how to localize them so if you come with either a focal multifocal or uh, weakness or with monoparesis and you have fasciculation as a dominant uh, defining feature very often you would end up with anterior hansel involvement so on the other hand if you have focal that is focal hand or limb weakness or multifocal weakness with monoparesis then you would think either a nerve or root involvement next coming to a common pattern you would get hemiparesis so hemiparesis with facial nerve palsy on the same side which we would call as an uncrossed hemiparesis you would say the lesion is above the brain stem it could be at the level of the internal capsule corona radiata or the cortex on the other hand if you come across hemiparesis with cranial nerve involvement that is a crossed hemiparesis then you would think of a brain stem involvement so you can have quadriparesis so quadriparesis uh, or paraparesis when it's coupled with sensory or autonomic involvement then the localization becomes to spinal cord and we have only quadriparesis you need to see whether it's proximal or distal so if you have proximal involvement with selectivity then you would consider a muscle disease if there is not much selectivity and it's predominantly distal then you would think of multiple nerves and if there is proximal and distal then you will think of root involvement if there is fluctuations or neuro or fatigability then you would consider neuromuscular junction involvement so so this is a general rule of thumb so when somebody comes to you with weakness you see the pattern of weakness see whether the tone is increased or reduced if it's a chronic disease then you will be able to make a fairly accurate clinical localization sensory symptoms is quite easy because the most useful thing in sensory symptoms is a pattern uh, sensory symptoms can be positive or negative positive uh, both have localizing values positive symptoms can be tingling paresthesia allodynia and uh, sensory loss numbness would be the negative symptoms so isolated pattern along a single nerve you would think of a mono neuropathy if it's along multiple nerves you would consider a plexopathy uh multiple nerves that are non contiguous will think of a mononeuritis multiplex so if it is along a dermatome you would think it's a nerve root involvement so if you get a level in the sense that along the trunk or the neck or the limbs always consider a spinal cord involvement so it can be a complete involvement it could be a hemicord involvement or you can get a segmental sensory loss where you would think of a central cord involvement and a glavin stocking paresthesias it can you would consider a multiple nerves or a polyneuropathy and hemisensory loss which is crossed you would think of a brain stem and uncrossed hemisensory loss you will think of thalamus or above so going on to another common uh, syndrome that you would come across it very often you would come across patients with uh, cranial nerve symptoms 
so when there are cranial nerve symptoms, which in the common symptoms wise, you would get uh, double vision, drooping of eyelids, a squint. So you may get uh, facial palsy, facial weakness, swallowing difficulty, hiccups, or what I go. These are all the cranial nerve symptoms that you would come across. So whenever that cranial nerve symptoms are there, along with weakness or ataxia, you would consider a brainstem syndrome. And once you say it's a brainstem, so, so unfortunately for clinical lo localization, you don't need to know all the intricate anatomies. Uh, so all you need to know is that uh, three and four cranial nerves are there in the midbrain. <coughs> Five, six, seven, eight are there in the pons, and and nine, ten, eleven, twelve are in the medulla. And also, you need to know a little bit of gaze. So, vertical gaze is controlled by midbrain, and horizontal gaze by the pons. So, in order to make a vertical diagnosis, so you need to work vertical level. So, once there's suspect of brainstem involvement, you see whether the third, fourth cranial nerves are involved, along with vertical gaze palsy. Then you would say there's a midbrain involvement. If the patient has got a crossed hemiparesis, or sixth or eighth cranial nerve involvement, then you would localize it to the pons. If ninth, tenth or twelfth are involved, then you would, or hiccups, then you would localize it to the medulla. The next way to localize the brainstem syndrome is whether it's medial or lateral. So in most sites and then along the brainstem, you would find that the corticospinal tracts are medially placed and the cerebellar tracts are laterally placed. And if you get ataxia, which is a symptom of cerebellar tract involvement, you will think that it's a lateral brainstem syndrome. And if you get hemiparesis or quadriparesis, then you would think that it's a medial brainstem syndrome. So two common syndromes that uh, anybody in clinical medicine should know is a stroke syndrome. Uh, stroke syndrome is uh, somebody with an acute onset focal neurological deficit. Uh, you need to consider, a, involving the CNS, you need to consider a stroke syndrome. And the first thing you need to do is rule out whether it's a stroke mimic or not. And Next question that you ask is, is it an anterior post-circulation stroke syndrome or a posterior circulation stroke syndrome? And an anterior circulation stroke syndrome is characterized by an uncrossed hemiparesis, or that means that the hemiparesis and the facial nerve palsy is on the same side. They may have monocular visual loss, they may have language symptoms, they may have neglect, but the defining feature is hemiparesis, which is uncrossed, or the facial nerve palsy is on the same side. So the next question that you need to ask is, is there dense hemiplegia or not? Dense hemiplegia means grade zero or one power uh, in both the upper and lower limbs. And that tells you that an area that is covered by both low limb, uh, upper limb fibers and lower limb fibers are affected. The common sites are the internal capsule and the brainstem. Because the patient does not have any other brainstem symptoms, we'd say this is a localized to the internal capsule. If there is no dense hemiplegia, that means there has to be differential limb weakness. Either the upper limb is more involved or the lower limb is more involved. If upper limb is more involved, then you localize to the lateral part of the cortex, which is supplied by the middle cerebral artery territory. If not, if lower limb is more involved, then you localize it to the anterior cerebral artery territory. Next thing you see is whether the cortical signs are present or not, which is aphasia usually in the left hemisphere and neglect on the right hemisphere, plus minus seizures. So if cortical signs are there, then you would localize it to the cortex. So another thing which is not mentioned here is that you can have dense hemiplegia and cortical signs then you would say that both internal capsule and the cortex is involved, which most likely tells you that a possible site of involvement is a proximal vessel, which is usually the internal carotid of the middle cerebral artery. Similarly, posterior circulation stroke, uh, the algorithm is very simple, exactly the same as a brainstem syndrome. Only two other sites that you need to consider is uh, in patients who develop visual loss or unexplained loss of consciousness. So you find that uh, either if the patient has... Uh, a low level of consciousness or isolated hemisensory symptom, then you need to localize it to the thalamus. And if the patient has got a visual field defect or a higher order visual symptom, then you would consider an occipital cortic cortical involvement. Otherwise, the approach to posterior circulation stroke is exactly like a brainstem syndrome. Okay, now let's uh, uh, apply whatever knowledge that we've uh, discussed now into certain cases. And I'll take you through some of the cases. And uh, you guys can also contribute. So our first case is a case of a 60-year-old man who had uh, come with difficulty in walking. He had some tightness of the limbs, tripping over objects. Uh, his weakness started in the foot and uh, he also developed decreased sensation below the chest. Uh, he also developed bladder symptoms in terms of urinary urgency and incontinence. Uh, and now he's also developed low back pain. So applying this, uh, let's say where he's got uh, 
one thing while applying diagnostic reasoning is that uh, the human mind is used to dealing with uh, concrete objects and small number of objects so decide as far as possible divide things into one or two or three categories and try to keep it simple uh, only go into the next level of understanding if the current level cannot explain all your findings so here let's say uh, this patient has got i'm not trying to see what pattern of weakness what uh, where is there what is involved so i'm just going to say motor sensory and bladder all three are involved and most likely you are dealing with the spinal cord involvement so that's all the information that is needed all the other information is needed at the next level of explanation not at this level so when you say motor sensory and bladder maybe there's a level because it's got a high discriminating feature you will say that this patient has got a spinal cord involvement now going on to the pathology and etiology very often pathology and etiology is given by the temporal profile of things so if things happen in seconds then you think of a vascular event or a trauma if it happens over days or weeks we'll think of autoimmune infections subacute causes you will think of toxic and chronic you will think of slow growing tumors genetic and degenerative etiology and this is across uh, symptoms and signs and across specialties so this is something that you can be used all over so let's go back here um, so so uh, the next level of understanding is that uh, where exactly in the spinal cord is it involved so here let's see that this patient has weakness started at the foot and then gradually progressed up and uh, the decreased sensation started from the foot progressed to the chest loss of sensation was there noted in the perianal region and patient had uh, bladder involvement also had low back pain so the next level of understanding is that what is the horizontal level of the cord in the sense that uh, is it a intramedullary lesion or an extramedullary lesion uh, before that we need to know whether it's a compressive lesion or a non compressive lesion so whenever there is two or more tract involvement and there is a localizable level always consider a compressive etiology there's no way that you can rule out a compressive etiology by reasoning so if there is a level and if there are more than two two or more tracts always consider compressive and this reasoning is of course for only insidious onset gradually progressive lesions but it's just a rule of thumb so there are ways of differentiating intramedullary and extramedullary lesion so in this particular patient patient is got a kind of an ascending pattern of weakness ascending sensory loss no radicular pain but there is sacral sensory loss and there is bladder involvement which is quite late in this case so between these two things i would choose that this patient is probably got an extramedullary compression and this is what the imaging showed so this is a 60 year old man when we summarize it's very important to frame uh, the uh, case summary so that the person who is listening to you is able to come to the same localization without having to go through the entire process of taking history and examining so this is a 60 year old man who's come with paraparesis which was ascending and has got a decrease a level at the mid chest with urinary incontinence so that localizes to the spinal cord and what is the pathology it was there's clear cut level and there are two or more tracts that are involved so it is a compressive etiology and in view of the ascending pattern we said it's a extramedullary pathology in this patient it happened to be that this patient had a multiple myeloma and there was a plasma cytoma at that particular level so that is the diagnostic process uh, so we so we were quite accurate in localizing it to the spinal cord by just looking at only three features motor sensory and bladder the co occurrence of this itself localized to the spinal cord all the other information we fitted in only in the next level of localization and not at, and that way we avoided a category uh, category error so next is a patient where is a 25 year old lady who's got uh, fever headache vomiting for 3 weeks following this she developed sudden onset of weakness uh, along with on one side of the body along with double vision and she's not able to open her left eye so again we'll keep it gross because always start with general symptoms so this patient has got cranial nerves cranial nerve involvement i'm not going to bother which cranial nerves are involved and this patient got cranial nerve involvement along with weakness so it has to be in the brain stem so that's all i need to do next step is to apply this so i'm going to say that this patient has got cranial neuropathy which is double vision here and uh, also has got drooping of eyelids and has got hemiparesis so fulfills the criteria for a brain stem syndrome the next two questions are where in the brain stem is involved so i'm going to see this patient has got uh, third nerve involvement because of ptosis diplopia would localize to either third or sixth so here i would and i would think that the midbrain is involved so on examination we also found that vertical gaze is gone so maybe midbrain is involved 
Next, I want to know is whether it's a medial or a lateral syndrome. This patient has hemiparesis. So straightforward our localization is to a medial midbrain syndrome. So it's quite here again, diagnosis becomes easy because uh, we started at a simple level with few features. Now we are going into the next level of localization. So, so if you had directly jumped to a midbrain syndrome, then you would have found that it's much more difficult to localize. So now let's go on to again. Uh, we found that this patient has got a medial midbrain syndrome. So this patient has a left third nerve palsy, right hemiparesis. Our anatomical localization was to the brainstem because of cranial neuropathy with hemiparesis. Then we said midbrain because the third nerve was involved. Because hemiparesis is there, we said it's a medial midbrain syndrome. And then clinically, we said this is a Web Weber syndrome. And this is the anatomical localization that we got because that is where the third nerve and the corticospinal tract fibers are together. And when we going on to the etiology, we said uh, this is uh, acute. I mean, it was quite subacute. So we'd think of, uh, especially in the context of fever, we'd think of an infection that is going on. Patients had fever and headache. We would think of a meningitic process uh, that would fit into an infective etiology. And that's what we found. So this patient had a Weber syndrome, a medial midbrain syndrome. And the etiology in this patient was a tuberculous meningitis. So we found that uh, the etiological diagnosis came in the end. So we would not jump to an etiological diagnosis at the beginning of the history itself. So that way we avoid category errors and diagnostic errors. So going on to the uh, case number three. So this is a gentleman who came with neck pain, arm pain, and weakness of all four limbs. Uh, patient had a sensory level in the mid chest level and patient had a bladder involvement. So where would you localize? Keeping it simple, we would say motor, sensory, and bladder has to be in this in the spinal cord, has all four limbs involved. So it has to be in the cervical spinal cord and that's what the imaging showed. And uh, we would call this particular imaging pattern as a longitudinally extensive transverse myelitis. So this patient was admitted to us and this was uh, days to weeks. So we found uh, and patient had fever at onset. So we thought maybe it's an infection because uh, previous patient also was a tuberculous meningitis. We were worried what it was. And we ended up with a diagnosis of neuromelioidosis. So we started the patient on keftrioxone and we did a CSF. Uh, while we were waiting, we found that the patient's aquaporin antibody came positive. So this is where we need to stop and think. So we ended up with a diagnostic error. So, so if you're wondering why did we end up with uh, neuromelioidosis, let's uh, look at this. Uh, so this is where we'll apply the base theorem. So let's say the probability of melioidosis in a case of LETM is proportional to the probability of uh, LETM due to melioidosis. So an LETM is not a common, uh, it's not an uncommon entity in neurology. So we've seen hundreds of cases over the years and in a month, in a month we would easily see one or two patients. So, and uh, we've seen only about uh, three patients with neuromelioidosis over the last uh, five years. So in order to make, if you see an LETM making a diagnosis of neuromelioidosis, uh, you need to reflect on what proportion of your LETM is due to melioidosis. So if the number of patients due to melioidosis causing an LETM is very, very low, be wary of making a diagnosis unless you find something, some defining characteristic that is very, very specific to neuromelioidosis. Of course, there are some like restriction of cranial nerve nuclei and certain uh, extension along the tracks, but this patient did not have any of those. On the other hand, let's take neuromyelitis optica. So neuromyelitic uh, I, myelitis optica as a cause of LETM is very, very common. So if a patient comes with LETM, what is the probability of uh, having neuromyelitis optica? Of course, the probability of neuromyelitis optica itself in the neurology ward is quite high because we see it quite common. We see hundreds of cases. And again, probability of LETM is quite high. And the probability, probability of uh, having uh, NMO and uh, LETM again is very high. So the, it's most likely that this diagnosis has to be an aquaporin positive. But why did we make this mistake? Of course, we were biased by the previous patient with tuberculous meningitis who had an infection. And in our ward, this is a real patient where we had uh, two cases of uh, neuromelioidosis, which we missed initially. And, uh, and one patient was actually admitted with neuromelioidosis at this point. And this is called as the availability bias. So because the most recent and readily available solutions uh, come into your mind. So, uh, so we gave too much importance. Uh, this is where actually applying the Bayes theorem uh, would actually help such uh, prevent us from making these diagnostic errors. So uh, this uh, is a case that uh, I claim to have uh, seen in OPD. So 
This is a 20 year old lady referred uh, from Shell uh, with uh, headache and papilledema. And uh, I looked at her fundus, there was papilledema and uh, I saw the imaging. I was quite convinced that it was an IIH. Uh, I did a CSF opening pressure was 30 and I started her on astrazolamide. And uh, she came back uh, to OPD a couple of days later and told me, uh, doctor, my local doctor said that my blood pressure is high. Uh, so I told her, uh, I said, don't worry, uh, when your intracranial pressure is high, your blood pressure will go up to compensate and send her off. And two days later, she was admitted uh, with a hypertensive crisis with emergency with a flash pulmonary edema. In fact, what she had is a accelerated hypertension with hypertensive crisis and uh, she did not have IIH. So, so here again, this is a confirmation bias. So I already assumed that this patient had an IIH because this patient was referred from Shell. So the context, so all the biases that help you make a diagnosis also will lead you astray. So a patient referred to Shell with papilledema in the neurology OPD is uh, always an IIH, hardly anything else. So I assumed that it was an IIH and treated as an IIH. I did an LP opening pressure was high, so I was convinced. So the cell count was normal, also I was convinced. But I didn't give importance to a negating information that the blood pressure was high. So if I had thought about why the blood pressure was high, then I would have found out that she had a glomerular nephritis and she had an hypertensive crisis and not an IIH. So, so you need to be aware of a confirmation bias. So that's why you need to systematically use the uh, metacognition to overcome such cog confirmation bias. Uh, so this is a patient who's currently in our ward. So this is a 30 year old lady who came with uh, monocular, some pain in the eye, which was noticed while moving her eyes and monocular visual loss. Young lady with visual loss, monocular visual loss is quite easy to localize along the pathway. So we had said that this is an optic nerve involvement, young lady pain, uh, she had some uh, mild ocular disc swelling. So we decided that she has an optic neuritis and we started her on steroids. So, but then when we went back, uh, we found that there is some problem. So we found that she's been, we went back and got history and we found that she's got chronic headache. Uh, before this symptom started, she had left eye pain and intermittent diplopia. And this diplopia, there was horizontal separation of images. And following this, she developed monocular visual loss. Of course, on a, additionally, on examination, we found that she had the left Horner syndrome. Uh, she had some uh, pain over the B1 dermatome, and she has an RAPD along with that. So instead of just saying optic nerve, now we were able to localize it to the orbital apex, uh, which because the fact that she had double vision, which is a cranial nerve involvement, uh, only site where optic nerve and uh, and other cranial nerves such as the third and sixth are involved is in the orbital apex. And, and we found that she's got an inflammatory disorder involving the cavernous sinus and the orbital apex, uh, most likely IgG4 or one of those spectrum of disorders. And we found that uh, the cause of this in view of the chronic headache was a chronic inflammatory disease affecting the meninges. In this case, a pachymeningitis. So this is called as a search satisfying. So somebody called me and said that 30 year old lady has come with monocular visual loss. Then I said, ah, must be optic neuritis. So my team said, yes, yes. So I also just stopped searching for any other cause. And that's how we ended up with a bias called search satisfying. So, so whenever you get a, uh, a straightforward case, always ask yourself, are we missing something? Is there another diagnosis that is going on? So now we let's look at how we can avoid such scenarios. One common theme in all diagnostic error is that inadequate history. So if you start applying your theories and hypotheses before you get history, you will always get a confirmation bias. So it's important to spend time, especially in a complicated patient, to get filter-free history. So I'll come to what you mean by a filter-free history is. Another thing is a premature closure. So like the previous patient with the optic nerve problem. So we had a premature closure. We already decided that is an optic nerve involvement in this. And the other thing is category errors. So when this patient came with monocular visual loss, I said optic neuritis. So that is jumping directly from the symptom to the etiology without going through anatomy, pathology, and etiology. So if I had gone through the anatomy, if I had said optic nerve and what site of optic nerve was involved, then I would have gone back and asked more history from the patient and we would have localized it to the orbital apex. We would not have jumped. So that is exactly what I mean by a category error. And ignoring the base rate. So for example, uh, in neuromelioidosis, if uh, overcalling a diagnosis, when you know uh, when you know that that particular disease is very very rare, uh, so that's another problem. And improper use of discriminating or defining features. Say for example, uh, like perioptic halo is a common condition that we see in a lot of our patients who have normal imaging, and very often they get referred to as idiopathic intracranial hypertension. So that may be a common finding, which does not have so much of discriminating 
uh, value. So this is something that you need to uh, gain by experience and reading up more and doing more research because each defining feature and discriminating feature will vary across tests, vary across populations. And another important thing is not updating clinical knowledge through feedback. So you should always be open to clinical diagnosis, always follow up your patients, make a diagnosis. If you're not going to make a diagnosis, you won't know whether you're right or wrong. Follow them up to see whether you're right or wrong because we're always good at learning from mistakes, learning on from follow-up. So otherwise you will be making the same mistakes again and again. So let's look at avoiding diagnostic errors in clinical diagnosis. So how would you do this? The most and most important thing that I put it in red so that that's the most important point is to get a reliable history. So get the context because uh, context of who, when, how, what, because context is everything and context lies in the history. So history is the single most important thing and the history should be so good that you are able to visualize the entire scene of what the patient is describing like a video in your mind. You should be played out. You should know where things are, what is happening. And uh, if you're not able to do that, that means your history is not reliable. You should not give too much importance to the history. So, and a relevant physical examination. So we are always happy to examine just to rule in a particular diagnosis. So if you're thinking of a UMN sign, uh, if you're LMN syndrome, not just looking at wasting, you should always look to rule out. So look for UMN signs, look for exaggerated reflexes, increased tone, and also learn to observe phenomenology. So, so this is where the filter-free history and filter-free examination comes in. So at some point in time, when you deal, realize that you're not dealing with a typical patient, just let go of all your theories and understanding and just try to put yourself in that patient's place and try to examine, uh, experience the entire scenario of how it's happening. So let them tell you all the details. This is when visualizing the entire history as a video helps. And also observe the phenomena. Very often, a lot of clinical phenomena are don't try to categorize them as a movement disorder or a particular disease or a particular jerk. Or a, so just observe the phenomenon and just describe it. And later then you can try to understand it. And that is how new clinical knowledge is also found. And keep it simple. So as we saw in, in some of these, so we just said core features, just take them, localize it to simple things like spinal cord. Only then go into intramedullary, extramedullary and those finer points. And the use of metacognition. So metacognition is nothing but thinking about thinking. So how can you do that? Some of these things are just checklists. So did I take a history? Did I take an examination? Did I check the funders? So you should have a checklist or a systems review in the traditional way of examining patient. Or another thing that uh, uh, our area of research and it's something is that we want to emphasize is the role of inner dialogue. So all of us in our minds always have an in inner dialogue and uh, it's important to use this inner dialogue to the benefit in clinical medicine. So you always ask yourself certain questions so I just listed some of these questions. It, this could, there could be more. So it's always important to ask, what is my anatomical localization? For every symptom that you see, every symptom that the patient says, always ask, what is my anatomical localization? And another important thing is, what are the alternate anatomical sites that could be involved? So this way you can get over your confirmation bias and a premature closure. So by asking these questions, uh, if, your, if your knowledge is good and your experience is good, your mind will give you answers to these questions. So, and what are the possible pathologies and etiologies at each of these sites you need to think about and always make a verbal statement of what is my diagnosis. So very often in a complicated case, you would not want to spell out your diagnosis. You just move on to investigations, always spell out your diagnosis. It's important to make a diagnosis. It's important to, even if it's wrong, unless you make the mistake, you're not going to learn from it. And two other important things that are important is to assume that your history is wrong then what? Then consider what is the alternate diagnosis. And assuming my examination is wrong, what is the alternate diagnosis? So, and if you're not able to sort it out, you're always, uh, I said, context is everything. So you always had a fixed point of view. Show to another person, a peer or somebody senior, and don't tell them what you're thinking. So don't tell them that oh, I have this case of optic neuritis, can you see? So don't bias them with your information. So let them have an independent view and come to their conclusion and see whether you can match. And whenever there's a difficult problem, always use the base rule, not in terms of finding probabilities or likelihood ratios, just conceptually thinking about it from your clinical experience. And most importantly, be humble. Nothing kills clinical skills like overconfidence. Remember, all knowledge is fallible. Yeah, thank you.
Thank you so much, sir, for this uh, wonderful lecture. Uh, I think if we have some time, can we take some questions? Yeah, I'll be happy to take uh, questions. Anybody has questions, they can ask now. Um, hi, Prabhaka, this is Tarun here. Hi, Tarun. Thank you so much for this uh, really excellent lecture. Uh, it's something that we all kind of have intuitively in our heads and it's really nice to see you, um, you know, tease it out and also your slides. So I think one is, um, how did you create those slides? What was your experience in coming through with this? But a more uh, neurologically localizing question is, in situations where you have, uh, you know, uh, disorientation and cognitive involvement, how, does, how do you approach localization? Uh, yeah, yeah, thank you for your question. So I'll address the question about uh, disorientation. Uh, so the simplistic model for cognition is uh, what I'd like to call the umbrella model. Actually, this is taught to me by George Johnson. So you can imagine brain is like an umbrella. So you have uh, a handle and you have a canopy. So the metaphor for the canopy is the brain and the handle is the brain stem. So if you have a problem uh, in consciousness or orientation, so either there has to be a problem with the handle or there are multiple holes in the canopy. So unless you are able to open out the umbrella, you won't know whether there are any holes in the canopy or not. Uh, so that means uh, I'd like to define two concepts. One is called as state functions and the other is called as channel functions. Uh, state functions depend on the reticular activating system, systemic factors like uh, uh, metabolic parameters, oxygen level, glucose, uh, whether the sepsis or not. And uh, channel functions are various brain functions like uh, language functions, attention, orientation. So only if your state functions are normal, you can actually test other channel functions. So only if you open up your umbrella, you will know whether there are holes in the canopy or not. So if there is a problem with uh, consciousness, uh, the two things that you would consider is, is there a brainstem problem or bilateral cortical problem? Or it's a systemic cause. So, so that would be a simplistic approach to uh, disorders of consciousness and orientation. But if the patient is disoriented or drowsy, you can't really comment on language functions or aphasia or visual functions. So that's also another corollary to it. So. Prabhakar, Sambu here. Uh, yes, sir. Thank you very much. Thoroughly enjoyed your lecture. So I, I, I think a lot of people will benefit immensely from this uh, localization. Somehow, I, I wish our medical students also get a chance to listen to your talk. So. Uh, with your permission, we'll share the video with medical students as well. Yes, I sir. I hope it's okay. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. So, and I, I also want to thank you because you personally arranged so many lectures for us over the coming weeks. So I just want to tell all the participants as well that thanks to Prabhaka, we have a series of nine, I think 13 lectures. So every week, just look out for the notices from Jennifer and Prabhaka and please come back and listen to these lectures. You can listen to them on our YouTube channel as well. Prabhaka, very honored and very happy with the lecture. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you so much, sir. Okay. Thank you all. Uh, and we hope to see you again next week for the next lecture. Are there any more questions in the chat box you have missed? I think there are no more questions in the chat box. So we'll end the lecture now with Jennifer. Yes, yes, sir. All right. Okay. Thank you, Jennifer.